Okay, welcome. Um, I'm Mirko Draka. I'm the director of the CAGE Research Centre at Warwick University, and I'm very pleased today to introduce the latest in our annual Crafts Lectures on Economic History. Firstly, a few words about Nick Crafts. Um, my predecessor is CAGE director at Warwick. Um, Nick has had a distinguished career with many appointments and, and prizes, including becoming a commander of the British Empire in 2014. I can list more of these achievements, but I think that's done a bit too much. And I think that we should focus, focus on, on the ideas that have been stimulating and that have been important. And this year, I want to highlight Nick's ability to use economic history to comment in depth on, on modern economic and social debates. This includes work such as his uh, 2014 Journal of Economic History paper with Nico Wolf on the Lancashire cotton industry in the, in the 19th century, which showed how agglomeration economies uh, can build competitive advantage uh, to defend against the, you know, the then threat of low wage international competition. It's further seen in his recent work discussing the role of artificial intelligence as a, a general purpose technology to be compared with the great inventions of the Industrial Revolution. And finally, I note Nick's ability to be provocative and promote uh, rigorous economic thinking in economic and social debates. See here his sharp editorial piece, Want Faster European Growth, Learn to Love Creative, creative Destruction, a piece which belies Nick's important influence on British economic policy thinking, particularly in the Treasury, since the late 1990s. Uh, the work of our keynote lecturer Claudia, today, Claudia Golden, um, also has massive contemporary relevance for you know, major social and economic debates. Uh, once again, I can list Claudia's record, PhD Chicago, Henry, Willey, Henry Lee Professorship at Harvard, and many awards stretching from the Richard Lester Prize in Labour Economics in 1990 to the Society <coughs> of Progress last year. Again, I think it's important to focus on the ideas. Um, and it's here that the body of work that Claudia has produced on gender equality, uh, which is incredibly relevant uh, uh, for the debates that Greg gained a heightened tenor in recent years. Um, one of the things that frustrates me about the want of a better term, the modern world, is the dwindling supply of rigor and thoughtfulness in these debates. And it's here that Claudia's work offers important data, findings, and economic models for understanding gender gender inequality in a rigorous way. This in includes important concepts such as her empirically grounded four phases model of uh, women in the labor market and her greedy jobs concept with regard to uh, the determination of joint household incomes. Um, reviewing the journals and working papers uh, series recently, I was struck by the emerging wave of rigorous, innovative, and policy-focused studies of gender inequality, all clearly influenced by Claudia's work. Okay? We live in polarized times, but when I look under the surface at these types of studies, I'm optimistic that, thanks to people like Claudia, we have the tools to tackle uh, these social and economic problems successfully and rigorously. Uh, without any further uh, kind of discussion, I'll introduce Claudia. After the talk, we'll have time for some questions. Those joining us online, um, just to contribute those to the YouTube question box. So, Claudia, I'll hand it over to you. Okay, th thank you so much. So, I am absolutely delighted to be with you today to deliver the Crofts Lecture, which I would have pronounced Crafts <laughs> in uh, my Bronx accent, but of course it is a Crofts lecture. Uh, Nick Crofts' work on industrialization, although it may seem somewhat distant from the story that I'm going to tell, is actually an integral part of the background since productivity changes drive shifts in labor supply through a host of income and substitution effects and general equilibrium effects. In addition, uh, Nick has several papers that perhaps people listening uh, don't know about, maybe they do, on marriage age and changes in marriage age and differences across areas. And that is certainly a key variable in my work. So my work is going to traverse 120 years 
from when college graduate women were able to have either a family or a career to now when many uh, on both sides of the pond uh, anticipate having both a family and a career. And as we have moved into this hybrid era that I will call ACDC, meaning after COVID, but unfortunately still during COVID, we may be on the cusp of real change in the workplace and in caregiving. And I'm going to take you on that journey of discovery from then to now. And the journey is going to wind up today when more women than men are graduating college. Certainly, that has occurred in the U.S. since 1980, so that's more than 40 years, and it's occurring across the globe. Uh, and uh, in addition, about the same fractions of men and women in the U.S. are achieving advanced and professional degrees. So there's great similarity in ambition but there's less in eventual achievement. And the reason concerns the concept of greedy work and the relationship between gender inequality and couple inequity, and also between gender equality and couple equity. These are the two sides of the same issue for different sex couples. Same sex couples, can have couple inequity and often do, but that won't give rise to gender uh, inequality. When different sex couples give up couple equity, they increase gender inequality. And that is something that I will be uh, explaining. A few clarifications at the start. My work is going to concern women and men who graduate from college because they have had the greatest opportunity to achieve what I'm terming a career, even when their numbers were low. And numbers in the U.S. were considerably higher for women graduating college and, and men, for that matter, throughout the 20th century, for example, up until the latter part of the 20th century, then in England, for, uh, for example. So the numbers weren't incredibly low early on, but they were pretty low. And the second clarification is that when I say the term career, I mean that as being very different from a job. A career is achieved over time. It comes from the Latin root to mean to run a race, Think of chariots and carriages. A job, however, is a spot position that enables an individual to earn a living. Aspirations and achievements of college graduate women across the past 120 years or so greatly changed, and I'm referring mainly to data that I have in the U.S., the reasons for the changes vary with the period. The labor market shifted its demands from brawn to brain work, technologies changed in the home. Think of the big things like electricity, uh, central heating, and clean water. And much later, there was greatly improved fertility control, enabling women to delay marriage and to delay childbearing. But the way work is structured and the persistence of social norms no matter how much weaker these social norms and traditions have become, mean lower ability for women to attain both a career and a family. The groups of college graduate women that I'm going to look at form what I think of as a succession of generations, each metaphorically passing a baton from one to the next the baton carrying on it, warnings and advice. And there are five distinct groups that I discern using um, data, which is demographic data and economic data, social data. The first graduated college in the US from around 1900 to 1919, it achieved family or career. The next, which was a transition generation, had first a job and then a family. 
the third, the mothers of the baby boom, graduated college from 1946 to 1965, and they had a family and then a job, sometimes a career. The fourth, which is my group, was the first to desire as a large group, a career and then a family. And the fifth, graduating since 1980s, desires a career and a family and has succeeded, we'll see, to some degree um, more than any of the others. And the only reason that I have a an upper limit on these groups is because I need to observe them until they're in their 40s. I'll discuss a little bit about the youngest group, but even those, we really have to observe them until they're mid-30s to really understand career and family. Now, the 120-year transition from career or family to career and family is bookended here with women, two women who served in the U.S. Congress, beginning with Jeanette Rankin, the first woman elected to federal office in the United States. She was typical of the career portion of her cohort. She had no children, she never married. She had one incredible, amazing career. She was from uh, Montana, by the way. At the other extreme in terms of time is Tammy Duckworth, the first Senator to have a baby while holding office and the first to bring a baby into an active session of Congress although, as everyone knows, there have always been babies in the U.S. Congress. She is an extraordinary member of Group 5 for a host of reasons, including her military service. Betty Friedan, looking rather coquettish, is in the middle here. I'm going to provide a little bit of detail on each of the first of these five groups. I'll tell you a little bit about the fraction who never married, by various ages, the fraction who didn't have children by age 45, and the fractions who worked, who were in the labor force, who worked uh, if they were ever married for younger women and for older uh, and for older women. So in group one, college graduate women uh, attained, as I said, career or family, few in this group would manage both. It was very rare. Uh, after all, 50%, as you can see, never had a birth or adopted a child. 32% never married. And just a small fraction were in the labor force, if ever married. In group two, which I said was more of a transition, more college women aspire to have careers, but that generally did not happen. Moving to group three, as job opportunities improved and as in America was swept up in early marriages and an incredible baby boom that was never seen before and has not been seen since, college women shared in that and shifted to planning for family first and then a job. Just 9% of this group never married, 18% never had a birth or adopted a child. That means that around 9% of the group who ever married never had a birth. You can see the enormous differences between group one and group three. It's sort of night and day. The employment of this group was low when it was young, but it greatly increased to almost three quarters when the women and their children were older. This was enormously progressive change. And in that sense, I am different from the conclusions in Betty Friedan's still popular book. Uh, it was progressive change since they found a way to have both a job and a family, and at times a career and a family. They trained to be teachers and nurses and social workers, librarians and admins, but only after the kids were grown. Career then family became the goal for many in group four, 
they delayed marriage for children. Uh, they delayed marriage and children for career. They had very high work rates when they were young. For group four, the pill and its dissemination to young single women enabled this delay of marriage and family and helped boost their investments in career. But the biological clock ran out on many. And as you can see here, 27% never had children or adopted a child. And there was this iconic Roy Lichtenstein print that although was done in 1964, uh, was the print that many in group four felt uh, represented uh, their lives. For group five, the goal is career and family. And as you can see, just 21% of the women we can track to their mid forties didn't have a birth or adopted a child. Marriage and family for group five were still greatly delayed. In fact, even more delayed than for group four, but birth rates were up. And of course, these are data that predate the uh, pandemic. And this is partly due to assisted reproductive technologies, which were and have been extremely important in enabling birth to women uh, uh, over their uh, 30s, in their 30s and 40s. You may be thinking that because of large increases in college graduation in the 20th century, that most of the differences across these groups concern selection into college. But the surprising finding is that selection in terms of these transitions was not that important. The elite changed along with the ordinary, what one might call the hoi polloi. An important accompaniment to this transition across the groups were changes in customs and norms. The General Social Survey has for some time asked respondents whether they believe that preschool children would likely suffer if their mothers worked. And the answers are graphed here by the respondents, birth year that's on the horizontal axis. And of course on the vertical axis is the fraction that agreed with this statement. And as you can see, agreement with this statement decreased for both men and women. Without new evidence, the response changed. Fewer agreed with the notion that children would be harmed if their mothers worked. The older norm became more expensive to sustain as earnings of women rose. I've said much about the aspirations for achieving career and family, but how did the achievement of career and family actually change across these groups? To compute that, I need definitions of career and family. And any definition is going to have its critics. I define family as having a child, biological or adopted. There is no requirement here for there to be a husband or a partner present. And for me, a uh, dog uh, aficionado for a long time, uh, dogs don't count, not even for me. Career is more complicated in terms of the computation, and I define it in a complicated way, well, not exactly that complicated, as exceeding, for women, exceeding some level of income, which is above the 25th percentile of the male distribution for men who have equivalent education and who are in the equivalent age group and cohort group for three years in each of the five year periods. It's not really that complicated. I do the same for men. I will provide rates of success from group three to group five and beyond a bit for two age groups, late thirties and early fifties. And the bottom line is that career and family success greatly increased both within each group as it aged and across groups. But even though women's success greatly improved 
it is today only just above half the rate of men. And one of the reasons that we can't go before group three very easily is because one needs true longitudinal data to do this. And I use the health and retirement study for the early groups and for the more recent ones, I use the National Longitudinal Survey of Youth uh, uh, 79 and then 97. The success rate for group three was what we might call abysmal. Just 5% had both career and family by their late 30s and 20% by their early 50s. Group four increased the success rate to around 15% when young and about 27% when it was older. For group five, there was about a 23% success rate when it was young and a one and about a 33% rate uh, of success when it was older. And note that the success rate for comparable males is between 50 and 60% for the 50 to the 54 year old group. And finally, I can uh, also compute the success for what I call group five plus. And for this latest group, we can track them to their late thirties and they've done a bit better than previous groups with rates around 28% in their late thirties or around still around 55% of the male rate. So there's been six increasing success for women over time, but by and large, women are still uh, not doing anywhere as well as men. So even though a succession of women has made considerable progress on the journey to career and family, women's careers still often take a backseat to those of their spouses. The most recent group has expressed enormous frustration and has placed the blame on many different factors, discrimination, managerial bias, pay inequity, sexual harassment. And to get a sense of their level of discontent, I've used counts of phrases in newspapers here at the New York Times. There are two waves. The first is in the 1970s, and then decreasing, and the next in the 2010s. The first one in the 70s, we think of as part of the noisy revolution of 50 years ago. And the second in the 2010s is in many ways the Me Too movement. But as each group progressed and passed a baton from one to the next, and as actual barriers fell, and as social norms really did change, the real underlying problem was revealed. There is no question that there is classic discrimination and bad actors in the workplace and biased workers and discriminatory supervisors. But most of the difference in earnings between men and women, particularly the college men and college graduate women is due to something else. The new problem with no name to paraphrase Betty Friedan is the notion of greedy work. That working more hours or particular hours leads to greater rewards even on an hourly basis. In up or out jobs, such as those in academia, more effort today produces a greater probability of having a promotion later. But to have a family takes time of at least one parent, and there is no way to contract that out entirely. And one wouldn't want to do that anyhow. Why have the children if you're contracting out everything? For a couple to share the joys equally is costly. So let me illustrate. One job here is flexible, that's the red line. And on the horizontal axis, let's say that these are actual hours, although it could be that we would want to map in which hour 
and on the vertical axis is total earnings. So the job that's flexible, the red line, has a linear wage with respect to hours. You work 10 hours, you get some amount, 10 times the wage. You work 40 hours, you get four times that amount. It's linear. The other job is the not so flexible one. That's the blue line. And it has a wage that rises with hours. That slope rises with hours. A couple with children can't both work at the blue dot. If they did, the children would perish. But they could both work at the red dot. But if they did, they would be leaving a lot of money on the table, which is that difference that I mark on the graph. So one works at the flexible job, the less remunerative red job, and the other works at the less flexible, more remunerative blue job. For many highly educated couples with children, she's a professional, but who is also on call at home. And he's a professional, but he's also on call at the office. In consequence, he earns more than she does. And that gives rise to a gender gap in earnings. It also produces couple inequity. If the less flexible job could be made more productive, as I've done here, the difference would be less and family equity would be much cheaper to purchase. Couples could purchase it, and at the same time, they would reduce the gender gap. Note that even for same-sex couples, there could still be couple inequity, but it wouldn't add to gender inequality. And even if a couple wanted a 50-50 relationship, and lots do, High earnings for a position with less controllable hours would entice them to specialize. Both would have jobs. It's not the old fashioned type of specialization, but one would have the less remunerative, flexible position, and the other would have the higher paying, more demanding in terms of hours and time and which hours and travel and meetings position. The point is that the gender gap in earnings is a symptom of career blockage. It is not the cause. The cause of career blockage is the high price of couple equity, the high price of flexibility. So what are the solutions? The most important part of any solution is getting the correct diagnosis. Given the correct diagnosis, I see three possible solutions. Two would involve changes in relative prices, and one would try to shift preferences. The first would involve lowering the cost of flexibility, which in this case is an amenity. Another would involve reducing the cost of childcare and elder care. The third would try to alter gender norms through some type of uh, incentives. Let's take a deeper look at the first solution. How would one lower the price of flexibility? The simplest way is just to create a good substitute for a worker. IT has been used to pass information and hand off clients with little loss of information and preserving great fidelity. Teams of substitutes could be created as they have been in pediatrics, anesthesiology, veterinary medicine, personal banking, many tech jobs, and primary care doctors. Teams of complements, though, as is often the case in consulting, increase the cost of coordinating schedules. The tale I have told was set in a period called BCE, by which I mean before the COVID era. What does it tell us about the new era? In mid-March of 2020, 
we descended into a DC world during COVID. Those who could sheltered in place and worked from home. And fortunate children had online schooling and at-home help. Parental childcare time doubled. In the age today of ACDC, schools are open, but care time is still probably higher than it was before. One edge of the silver lining to these dark times is that we have begun in the U.S. a national dialogue about caregiving. Of course, in more recent months, that dialogue is sitting somewhere under the floor of Congress. We in America had this conversation before. In 1943, when we desperately needed non-working mothers to help on the home front to win the war, we created subsidized preschools open from early morning to evening, and we extended public school hours. We then abandoned these policies because women were not as important to the economy. But women are now half approximately the labor force, somewhat less in terms of total hours of work. We've learned in the pandemic that the economy runs on women. Another edge of the silver lining is that we have learned, as we see right now, to make technology work. And we've seen it that we can use technology to work remotely from home. And as long as that doesn't become a female enclave, it will serve to lower the cost of flexibility. We've always had flexible jobs, but they were expensive. If one doesn't have to go to Tokyo to do the merger and acquisition, if one doesn't have to go to Zurich to sign the contract, parents and especially women will be able to take positions that have always been quite lucrative, but which they haven't been able to take. Another part of the solution, therefore, is to reduce extensive travel, and we are seeing that extensive travel is being reduced. For example, I am not with you today. So, um, uh, but what we have to guard against is having work from home be, as I said, a female enclave. We should make the amenity less expensive by making flexible work more productive. The story that I have told was for the BCE era, but it's exactly what we need in our ACDC world. Before March of 2020, in this time I've called BCE, the reasons women were being held back from achieving career and family became clearer and clouds parted, allowing us to see what was blocking their way. And what was blocking their way was greedy work and the relationship between gender inequality and couple inequity or gender equality and couple equity. These are, as you can see, two sides of the same issue. When couples give up couple equity, they increase gender inequality. Thanks very much. Really interesting lecture. So I now now start uh, a questions period. So at first I'll take questions from the room. Would anyone like to kick off? Yes, Bishnu. Uh, thank you, Claudia, for this fascinating talk. Um, the you emphasize a lot on policies that can be adopted to you know, help this uh, equality to, uh, to be achieved. But there are cultural issues, particularly you know, men do not cook in some cultures, it's not everywhere. That seems more complicated than just you know, for the government to step in and provide childcare. So are there solutions that you can see in cultures which are much more gender 
only to give them time. You think everybody's so, going to convert, which is very possible, which is very so. Uh, so as as I mentioned when I was talking about changes in gender norms in the U.S., why is it the case that we began with in the period that I was looking at, uh, eighty percent of people would say that it's harmful that preschool children would suffer if their uh, mother worked outside the home. Uh, and now it's it's a very, very small group, even in the U.S., with its uh, uh, certain highly conservative uh, areas. And one of the reasons is that the value of women to the household of going outside the home to work became enormously uh, large. And so that certainly, so um, having programs that encourage women, that enable women to uh, earn more, uh, programs that enhance their human capital, for example, programs that enable their skills uh, in various ways. And there, there are probably, you know, I know that that our graduate students working in many parts of the world are working precisely on these programs, and um, and change is is certainly afoot. I mean, I was working on this issue in Saudi, and was amazed at the rap rapidity of change. Great. Okay, uh, Dennis has a question. Yeah. Um, hi, Claudia. Thank you so much. This is really wonderful. I have a question about lesbian couples. Um, so you describe that, especially if there's a child and care responsibilities arise, then once the couple decides to give up the path that they go in the same direction, like in terms of one, one person in the couple takes up a job, a full-time career, the other one is more focused on the child, that typically leads to gender inequality with a man earning more than a woman. I was wondering if you look at a lesbian couple, do you see the same thing that if there's say a child in the couple, that the within couple inequality rises, that one woman has a much higher trajectory than the other? And for the matter of fact, you could ask the same question about gay men. Do you see the same thing that happens within a gay couple, gay men, that within couple inequality rises in the same way as it would for a heterosexual couple? So that's certainly at the frontier of, of empirical work since we haven't had enough data. Um, there, there, there's no question that one certainly could find that. And there are a lot of sociological stories and anecdotes and small pieces of data that suggest that it, it would. I mean, why would it be the case that a lesbian woman wouldn't be faced with the same options in the workplace as a straight woman and to the extent that she was was faced with them then or or a uh, a gay man uh, then one would have the same little picture that i drew where you know uh if if they didn't specialize they would be leaving a lot of money on the table now one could say that uh you know w once we get enough data that if we uh, don't see as much of this in these couples, that even though there is a lot of money lying on the table, they have greater preferences for couple equity. R remember that it, 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 it's just, that, is, that difference was the price of couple equity. Uh, the other interesting point, and, and there was a wonderful piece in the Times a couple of weeks ago, about a, a lesbian couple who took uh, turns having the child. So one had the baby, the first baby, and one had the second baby. And they switched off so that therefore there was a time when one was in the labor force a lot more than the other one. And then they, then they switched off. Those are of course um, special and interesting uh, examples, but this is a great question and one that um, 
as we get more data, particularly I know in the in the U.S., we finally have the ability to have these data because um, same-sex marriage is uh, reported in the ACS. Great. Okay, so another question. Yes, thank you so much. Um, I have a question about how your story interacts with uh, income. So should we think about uh, this child penalty story um, as fairly similar across different income brackets? Or is there a stronger penalty for low income earners, middle income earners versus top income earners? And that's also in relation to the time series um, of female satisfaction you showed uh, that seemed to negatively correlate with uh, economic growth. Um, I was wondering if you got any thoughts on that. Right. So it, it always surprises people that the gender earnings gap is enormously high for the highest income people. But of course that's the case because the distribution, the right tail is extremely long and e even the medians differences in the medians is much, much greater. So for uh, lower educated and lower income individuals, the gender gap is is much much smaller, and the motherhood penalty is much smaller as well. Right. Okay. Um, so this is a pause. I've got a question myself, Claudia. So it seems like we're going through a second quiet, uh, second noisy revolution, like a, a sequel to the, like the sixties, seventies noisy revolution. So do you think this current sort of post Me Too noisy revolution has that got Econom specific economic roots, or is it something cultural that perhaps emanates from like, new social media technologies being developed? That's a very, very good question. Uh, there, one, one might look at the data and say that uh, it's a um, it's coming from the notion that uh, that there wasn't a lot of uh, a lot of change in the more recent period that, you know, many sociologists uh, talk in the U.S. about the unfinished revolution and stagnation. And I think that it's it's coming about uh, because of a, uh, a, a sense, you know, a, a sense of frustration and frustration that uh, comes is in some sense uh, then the the targets of this frustration, uh, you know, the, the individuals are targeting the notion that there are. This is all due to the fact that there are biased supervisors and workers and sexual harassment, and of course that's the case. But that it, it isn't, and that was the point that that isn't really the um, the heart of the problem. So we, we can get rid of all of that and we would still have a huge uh, motherhood penalty and a huge, thus, gender gap um, uh, uh, in, in terms of earnings. Now, l let me, uh, as a historian, and because we're all historians, let's go back to the noisy revolution of the late 60s and early 70s. And that, too, in many ways came about because there was tremendous change in female labor force participation, but those uh, signs that women carried, 59 cents on the dollar, 59 cents on the dollar, that's not enough. Um, the ratio of female to male earnings was stagnant in the 60s and early 70s. But once again, the reasons for that, we can look back and we can see that the reasons for that were not that there was growing discrimination. The reasons for that was that labor force participation was increasing and pulling into the labor force individuals whose labor market experience was distant and brief. So, you know, it's really uh, what individuals um, on the ground in revolutionary times 
express in terms of what they think is the cause sometimes is not. Correct. Uh, another question? Yeah. Thank you for the talk. I have a question about um, what you mentioned on really work and it is really work. And uh, my question is whether there's any evidence on what's causing that increase and perhaps thinking about the role of labor relations and the kind of unions in that increase. Yeah, so I, I don't think there's much in greedy work that, that has anything to do with the decline of labor unions in the U.S., uh, although I, I can say something about low-income workers, and I'll do that in a second. I, I think that much of this is coming about because of the enormously uh, rising income inequality in, in the U.S. And, and, uh, and in many other places that greedy work for a host of occupations comes about uh, because there is this uh, greater ability to have uh, uh, higher income, that, that there are lawyers that make a ridiculously large amount and therefore firms have been willing to, uh, to pay these uh, enormously large um, amounts. But I think it's, it's as well <laughs> due to the fact that uh, men, and, and let's talk more about men, men have not said, uh, you know, I'm missing something in life. I, I want to spend as much time with my children as their, their mother does. And therefore, uh, I, you're going to have to, in fact, pay me even more to miss that Sunday soccer game. They're going to have to pay me even more to go to Tokyo on these weekends to sign that contract. And firms will then wake up and say, well, we're not going to do that. We're just going to have redundancy in our firms and we're going to get around this. This happened. It happened in the field of pediatrics. It happened in the field of veterinary medicine. It happened in uh in the field of of um uh of uh, in tech fields for example so there is an ability for it to happen let me say one word about the lower income issue uh, most of this uh, discussion is about college graduates they're 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 in a different group than the group that is out there in the US for example trying to uh, rejuvenate the, the, the uh, labor union movement. But in the lower income group, there's also issues of greedy work for in terms of scheduling, for example. Uh, so the individual who, the woman who um, has a child to take care of or wants to uh, advance her her human capital and 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 take courses at a community college uh, can't work in a firm uh, that's going to uh, schedule her uh, in uh, for the next day and and in the U.S. many states have legislated uh, against that type of um, uh, improper scheduling. Thanks. Great. All right, I've got two more questions. Yeah. So uh, I was thinking that if um, this largest uh, income inequality, you know, gender gap is concentrated in the top of the income earners, these are also the ones that could in principle afford uh, uh, the longest time in childcare and, uh, and the best type of services. So I, I was wondering how much the economic explanation uh, it really matters here as opposed to uh, you know, still the cultural one, even within the United States. But that gets to my point, and I will say it again. You cannot contract it all out, period. And if you did, you should never have had the kids in the first place. <laughs> okay, uh, Steve, you've got a question. Yes. Um, you focus very much on the United States. Most of your examples came from the United States, and you focus on change over time. I was just wondering if we, we know that the gender gap varies spatially as well. If 
across countries. Do you see, does that variation across countries, have you thought about the explanations for that variation and the implications for your explanation? Um, so you'd, you'd have to fill in with, uh, the ex the example that I'm supposed to say why that's different from what I came up with. So well, the, the, say the gender gap is much smaller in Scandinavia, the gender wage differences. Yeah. And um, the, and, and but, but there, there's a wonderful piece by Fran Blau and Larry Kahn in which they show that even that gender gaps are not, you know, are fine within a country. If you compare across countries, then you'd better look at where the individuals are within the income distribution. And in fact, <laughs> the women were at, in the US were at a higher percentile in the male distribution than women in Sweden were in the Swedish male distribution. But might, might we expect to have seen more teams of uh, substitutes rather than complements in countries with lower wage, wage gaps, for example? Uh, that, that's an interesting point. So your point is that um, that e even though uh, that at places that have very narrow distributions, it, it may in fact feed into what I said before, that it may be that that the uh, expansion of economic inequality in the U.S. is what has fueled uh, greedy work. And if the entire distribution is more compressed, there would be less greedy work. Yeah. It's it's hard to separate in a place like Sweden, of course, what is coming about because um, the country has engineered uh, a change in uh, in 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 some in in what is done within households by uh, greatly reducing the price of childcare, and so therefore. Um, their childcare costs that you know they did two things they they took the first year of a child's life and essentially said a parent can take off and receive full salary for that and for the rest of it we're going to subsidize uh, three quarters of the price well that that's a tremendous amount for government to do that may have, and together with uh, uh, a narrower distribution of, of, of earnings period that may have catapulted um, preferences to a, a different set of preferences. Sure. Uh, could we have that in the US? Could we have that anywhere else? My sense is that yes, one could, but uh, there is a large group <laughs> in the US that would be highly, highly resistant to that. In fact, uh, the only negative comments I have gotten on my book, and I was expecting them to come from the left, came from the right. <laughs> there was someone who wrote a, uh, a review of it that said, she is no feminista, no radical feminista, but she doesn't realize that the vast majority of Americans want to take care of their own kids. So that that's the group that in the U.S. Uh, is holding this back. OK, um, I think I can't resist a final question, actually, because this just kind of made me think, Claudia. OK, so, you know, I commented, you know, this. Sometimes I'm frustrated by you know, the fact that a lack of evidence or a lack of um, policy supported by clear evidence in kind of modern debates, right, about gen, you know, kind of gender issues. So, is there one policy or, or one piece of evidence, okay, uh, about kind of gender in the economy that you think needs to be highlighted, right? So, something that's been neglected, right, it's been 
neglected in the focus in, in, in current debates, right? Some piece of evidence or some policy that we're missing. Is there a missing piece that we can easily get to? Um, in, in, in other words, you're saying if I were to uh, respond to someone who said um, the solution is to get rid of discrimination, to get rid of uh, biased supervisors, what I would say. Exactly. Something like that. Yes. Yeah. Well, all one has to do is look at gender gaps that evolve. I mean, uh, essentially the motherhood penalty and ask so it's not it's not being a woman and it's not um having a child at all it's having certain uh responsibilities that you have to be on call at home at the same time you have a job great okay um that's similar kind of to, to my perception of it as well. All right, I'll leave it there unless someone's got a burning question. Um, uh, if Nick is still on the line, I'd like, Nick, is there anything you'd like to, to say? I am still Thanks. on the line, yeah. Great. <laughs> well, first of all, actually, Claudia, I want to say congratulations on you know how to pronounce my name. It is in <laughs> it is indeed crafts, and I never heard anybody pronounce it crafts till I went to Cambridge as a student. Uh, so please carry on pronouncing it as you would. It's pretty much how okay. I well, thank you. It. I was I was just copying what others had said. Well, Mirko is a fairly ignorant colonial. I wouldn't take too much yeah. notice of <laughs> notice of his pronunciation. Anyway, I think. My, what I wanted to do was just thank you for a wonderful lecture. Thank you very much. Uh, it just flies the flag so high for economic history, as well as, of course, the, the, the subject that you have so dear to your heart. So brilliant, well done, and above the standard of the previous lectures, as I told you it would be. <laughs> okay. So thank you. And I think yeah. And if everyone in the room would like to join in and thank Claudia. All right, I think we have we got the barbecue coming up. Jeff.